Hey everybody, uh, HDub here. I have a quick little presentation on dreaming for those in the intro to psych uh, learning environment um, during this uh, distance learning for all. So this is uh, also posted just as a presentation because the next slide has a video that I don't necessarily need to play while I'm recording because that just makes the video longer, which makes it longer to upload, etc. So here we go. Um, this is kind of a, a I don't know, I, I pulled together a couple different presentations from uh, AP Psych. So some of this is going to sound like fairly wonky and fairly like super academic. Uh, and it was pr primarily for the AP Psych kids uh, when we we're in this unit of study. So if you like learning about uh, psychology and you want to uh, continue with this, maybe in another class, uh, by all means, consider taking AP Psych at some point, your junior and senior year. I mean, you can take it your sophomore year. I have a couple in there. Uh, but generally speaking, it's for uh, you know juniors and seniors. Uh, and it goes into a little bit more of the academic side of this. Um, but it's still pretty fun, uh, and you get to know a little bit more about psych. So in the first part of this uh, presentation, we talked a little bit about sleep itself uh, and what exactly sleep is. Um, so this slide is it's primarily a, re a reference to uh, a previous video that you don't need to watch for intro to psych. Uh, that's for AP Psych. Um, but it, it, if you're interested at all, um, just kind of look up some of these some of these terms, um, what is sleep and what are circadian rhythms. Uh, stages of sleep uh, are in there, uh, and that's uh, super important uh, to you guys as, as adolescents because you just don't get enough, uh, period. Like, according to every study that I've ever seen, um, three hours of sleep is not even close to enough. Neither is four, neither is five, and neither is six. We're actually talking about like eight and a half, nine, nine, nine plus hours of sleep for adolescents, um, so it just doesn't work out. Anyway, uh, there's that. That's neither here nor there. So uh, neurotransmitters are involved in here uh, as well. Um, and so if you're looking at like brain chemistry, that that's gonna that's gonna play in here. Uh, one sec. Sorry, son's taking a lunch break right now and uh, has a TV on watching a cartoon uh, or watching YouTube actually. Uh, funny. This is this is also on YouTube. All right. So anyway, here we go. Uh, neurotransmitters. So brain chemistry is involved, uh, and you can take a look at uh, at some of those. Uh, neurotransmitters that are that are involved in, in sleep cycles. Uh, there's also some disorders, uh, sleep paralysis or awareness during sleep paralysis, uh, and then also uh, how much should you be sleeping? I already kind of talked a little bit about that. So interesting related topics, but not for this particular presentation because this is all about dreams. Uh, this week we're going to talk about dreams. Uh, the next slide on this uh, just has us watch a video. Uh, so I'm going to ask you guys just to, to do that Offline again, I don't necessarily need to watch this uh, video with you. You can do that uh, offline, uh, and, it, and it, it it does a good job of just kind of kind of giving the, the the broad strokes of this thing. So I'm going to start the actual presentation here. Uh, so here we go. Uh, why do we dream? I'm going to be a three uh, three kind of theories behind dreaming. Uh, we're going to talk about Freud uh, and um, a kind of a psychodynamic approach to dreaming. We're going to talk about cognitive theory. Uh, and then activation synthesis theory. Um, so e each of those three has its own, um, you know, positives and negatives, and, and that's why we're we're dealing in in the world of theory and not in the in the world of I know exactly what a dream is, because uh, we don't. Uh, we have we have these theories. So at the end of this thing, uh, I'll ask a, a question essentially like which of the three do you, do you buy into the most? Uh, which do you like the most? That kind of thing. And then that's one of the, the activities you'll engage with on Google Forms for the week. So uh, first, we'll talk about um, this this problem. Um, dreaming, uh, it says, I'm going to move my head. There we go. Uh, dreaming uh, is internal, personal, and hard to quantify or qualify. So it's the same issue uh, with reality and our concept of truth. Uh, there, it's really hard to measure that, and, it's, and psychologists are really trying to, to measure things um, objectively, just like a scientist would, right? So um, because a dream is happening to us and we're comprehending the dream in an altered state, how do we know exactly what is what it is that's being reported back? Uh, and, and can we actually trust the reporting back of the person who's been doing the dreaming? Uh, so it's kind of, a, kind of a sticky wicket in trying to, to observe uh, objectively and measure objectively what's going on with dreams. So we, we get the, we get the, the theory. Um, we don't have a truth. We don't have a, um, you know, an algorithm to figure this out. We don't have any kind of a test that we can perform while someone's dreaming to extract what that dream is and then exactly what's happening with that, right? So 
Um, that's the cool part about psychology is we sometimes we just don't know and we have these theories and sometimes uh, that's also infuriating to some people because they want answers. All right. Um, next slide. Here we go. So current research indicates that most dreams are not strange, but they're uh, similar to waking life. Uh, remember the unusual is... Uh, is we remember the usual, the unusual, not the usual. So think about this: you're going through your day, uh, and every given second of your waking day, you're being bombarded with information, right? Sensory information is coming at you from every single uh, aspect, everything from sounds that you hear, from sights that you see, from uh, temperatures in the room to smells, uh, how uh, you know where you're sitting internally, your your uh, physically how you feel, externally how you feel. All of those things are giving us, are giving our brain something to, to consider. Uh, and so if we were to pay attention to every single piece of information that gets in our heads, like we would, we would go crazy, right? We, we wouldn't be able to, to handle it. We would totally short circuit and it would be over for most of us. Um, so uh, one theory uh, indicates that uh, or suggests that uh, when things are abnormal, that's when we start to pay attention to them. Um, and so we remember... Only the weird stuff that happens in our dreams, not necessarily uh, all the normal stuff that happens in the dreams. Just like uh, most of our memories are made up of um, exceptions to general rules, right? So our memories are, are made up of things that were out of the ordinary. We don't usually remember the ordinary. Uh, also on this slide, uh, neuroscience is involved here. Again, this is kind of wonky and academic. And so if you want to know about this, by all means, go for it. But in intro to psych, not necessarily super concerned with the actual neuroscience behind it. Uh, definitely will be in, uh, in AP Psych though. Okay, so first, uh, Freud's idea and psychodynamic uh, approach here. So there's like two different things going on in a dream. We have what's going on on the literal level and then there's what the, that literal level means, right? So we have manifest content versus latent content. Um, dreams, according to Freud, uh, symbolize unconscious wishes and desires and motivations, things that are happening on the subconscious level without our understanding exactly what's going on. Um, so uh, the analysis of the symbolism in the dreams is going to unlock or allow us to unlock some of the subconscious issues that we're struggling with. So uh, what we look is that we look at the manifest content, which is the dream's surface content. Um, that's the literal level. And then we take a look at, once we understand what happened in the, the dream, then we look at latent content or the hidden content, unconscious and true meaning of what the dream is. So for example, let's say that I have a dream about getting chased by a red-haired gorilla. And, and that may or may not have hap actually happened. Um, so I'm, I'm being chased by the gorilla and I am um, almost about to get caught. And then the gorilla stands over me, uh, smiles and says, uh, I gotcha tag, you're it, and then runs away. Let's say that's my dream. Uh, the manifest content would be what I just told you. I'm being chased by a red-haired gorilla. I get caught. He smiles and says, tag, you're it. The latent content, then, the psychoanalyst, um, the, the therapist would say, okay, let's sit down and just try to figure this out. Uh, what is a gorilla? What does that mean? Uh, what does it stand for? You're being chased. Is there anything in your real life that you, that you feel like you're being chased by uh, or that you're running away from, right? And we kind of go in and we try to make some of these connections. Why is it a red-haired gorilla and not a gray-haired gorilla, a silverback gorilla? Like what, what's going on with that? Uh, and, and so we try to un, un, unpack or unlock the latent content. And we might find out that um, I feel like um, I am being pursued by uh, my desire to, uh, or I'd be being pursued by uh, doubts of, of being a, a good father, and so the reason it's a red-haired gorilla is because my son is red hair, uh, and so he, he finally catches up to me, and then he smiles, uh, which means that uh, he, everything's okay, uh, and that was his my mind's way of, of letting me know that I'm actually being a good dad, and he's just playing around, right, and, and to remember to always play, tag you right, right, that's what that means. Totally made that up, that did not happen, or did it? That's one theory. Another theory is the cognitive theory. Uh, this one kind of takes uh, Freud's idea and says, yeah, you guys are crazy. Uh, dreams are subconscious cognitive processing, uh, information processing, and memory is going involved here. So essentially what happens is we think uh, during dreaming just like we think when we're awake. Our brain doesn't ever stop 
uh, you know, functioning. So uh, essentially what ha what's happening is, is our dreams are, um, are relaxed daydreams. Um, they're dramatizations of general life concerns, right? It's, it's, it's called oftentimes the default network. Uh, there's a collection of neurons active during the mind uh, when, you're, uh, when your mind is wandering and when you're daydreaming. Uh, it might be the same network that's used during dreaming. Uh, and so the cognitive theory is that we're just processing things that happen to us. Um, we are engaged with the memories of the day uh, or memories of the past couple of weeks, uh, things that are existing in our, uh, in our working memory. Uh, and, and we're just kind of processing it. And our brain uh, is continually trying to understand what's happening and take the input uh, and make sense of it. So what we're doing in, uh, when we dream is, is we're just trying to make heads or tails out of all the things that happened to us during the day uh, that we couldn't pay attention to, right? So, uh, for example, uh, I might uh, remember a face of someone. Well, that one theory is that I saw that face at some point during the day. I just didn't recognize that I saw it, right? Because uh, it was a face in a crowd, for example, or I was at the grocery store and that was the face of the person behind me. Things that you don't necessarily lock into your memory, right? Like, oh my gosh, I have to remember every single person I encounter. That's not what we do. So, but your brain still has that sensory input. Um, and so one, one idea here is that we're just working through all the things that happened to us that we couldn't necessarily um, pay attention to during the day, during conscious thought, right? And so that same part of our brain uh, is engaged at night. That makes sense. All right, and moving on. The next idea is the activation synthesis theory. Uh, so this app, according to this theory, uh, the brain uh, is, is trying to make sense out of random brain activity occurring during sleep. So instead of there actually being a meaning behind it or like some particular piece of sensory input that we, uh, that we got during the day and then our brain's just trying to wrestle with it at, at, now that everything's quieted, this theory says your brain is firing off all the time, like it never stops, like I just, just said. Uh, and what the rest of the brain is trying to do is try to make sense of this, uh, this activity in the brain, right, that is creating stimuli. Um, so what's happening is uh, we've got this, what's called cognitive trash, I love that term. Our brains are trying to make sense out of random brain activity occurring during sleep, and they're calling it cognitive trash. Our brain is just gonna produce uh, stimulus uh, or stimuli during sleep, uh, and the rest of the brain tries to figure out what's happening to it. Um, so external stimuli is still happening when you're asleep. So um, like something might happen in the room that you're sleeping in. Uh, the heater might kick on or the furnace, right? And you get the, a rush of air. You might have um, stimuli coming from uh, ambient noise like uh, the birds uh, or the crickets outside or the frogs uh, or uh, an, an owl hooting or... Um, the hum of, um, I don't know, some, some kind of piece of um, hardware in your house. I don't know, right? So that, that's still happening. So that stimuli is happening. Also, we have internal stimuli happening in your brain uh, as you're asleep. So what's happening is the brain is, is still getting input, still dealing with stuff, is still firing off um, you know, um, electrical impulses, and the rest of the brain is just trying to make sense of it, right? And it, and it creates these narratives um, to try to do that, try to process just the random cognitive trash that's happening in our brains. Um, one of the criticisms here is the brainstem is not only starting, is not the only starting point for dreaming. Uh, experiences shape dreams more than um, this particular system does, um, than, than the activation th synthesis theory accounts for, right? Um, again, so this is just a, one of those uh, strange charts that you might find on the internet, but like the spontaneous firing of neurons is happening down here in the brainstem uh, and those firings are going off into the rest of the brain, which then tries to synthesize, right? Hence the, the term, it starts to synthesize uh, these signals uh, and interpret them. Um, so uh, probably dealing less with visual input and stimulus, except for if you've ever watched anybody sleep, their eyes are still darting around, right? So they're still seeing things even though their eyes are closed. Um, they're still gonna be hearing things even though there's nothing really happening uh, externally except for a small hum, right? Uh, they're not hearing voices, they're not hearing that kind of thing in the ambient uh, environment, so their brain is, is creating uh, those experiences. Kind of crazy stuff. Um, so that's, uh, that's it for this particular uh, slideshow. Uh, hopefully you guys have a little bit of understanding of the three uh, main theories of dreaming. 
And we'll take that uh, information in as we read the uh, Nat Geo article about uh, why people are having such strange dreams during the coronavirus pandemic that we're all experiencing right now. So take a look at, at that next. Uh, here's the, uh, the link. If you guys are looking at the, the slideshow itself, you can link to it directly here. Uh, it's also linked in the Google Classroom for this uh, posting. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, hopefully you're able to engage with, um, with this and uh, have a great week. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.